It's flu season here in Columbus. Some of you might have gotten sick, but I hope that most of you took the flu vaccine and did not get sick. Did you know that the flu is caused by a virus and the vaccine is a product of science? Many researchers get together to understand the ecological and evolutionary rules that govern the flu virus. They do this to try to predict which flu virus strains will be dominant next year. The better they understand these rules, the better the vaccine. And you probably know about a lot of other human viruses, Ebola, HIV, hantaviruses. These star in movies. They strike fear in our hearts. They're killer viruses. But I doubt many of you have heard of cytomegalovirus, or CMV. But two out of three of us in this audience are infected by them. They lay hidden, and they wait for your body's immunocompromised position before they actually cause problems. And a third kind of human virus I'd like to talk about are those like smallpox. Smallpox has been eradicated by science. The vaccine was so good, so effective, smallpox is only known to exist in laboratories. Now, humans are not the only things inf infected by viruses. Plants and animals are as well. The next time you go into your garden and your prized tomato plant is doing beautifully, and then all of a sudden its leaves start to wilt and yellow, it's probably a virus. Or your pet dog or cat gets sick or foot and mouth disease, that could be a virus. It turns out that those viruses we might think of as bad, they cause disease. There's thousands of labs around the world that study these viruses. And their goal is to stop those viruses doing what they do. I'm here to tell you about other viruses. These viruses few people know about. They and their hosts are hidden from us, yet their impacts are all around us. They impact ecosystems throughout the planet, including our bodies. And if we could understand the ecological and evolutionary rules of these viruses, we could harness their power for good. This is part of a tree of life. I've talked about viruses that infect humans, plants, and animals. But you can see they're a tiny sliver of this part of the tree of life. The other two thirds of the tree of life are hidden from us. These are microbes, single-celled organisms called bacteria and archaea. Microbes are important. Stop for a second and look at the person next to you. Human, right? <laughs> they actually have as many microbial cells as human cells in their bodies. And if we counted genes, there's 100 times more microbial genes than human genes. You could say we're as much or more microbial than human. When we think of microbes and humans, we think of washing our hands. We think of antibacterial soap. We think of keeping away bad microbes, pathogens that make the news and headlines because they cause damage. But you are teeming with good microbes. And those good microbes as a collective are known as your human microbiome. And they've lived with us and with humans for a very long time. But we didn't know about the human microbiome and its importance until recently when we could start to see them. New tools and new techniques, new analytics. And we've already learned in just a few short years in the world of science that the human microbiome is responsible for what, much of what we think about as human. Your behavior can be driven by microbes. Whether you're obese or lean can be driven by microbes. The food that you crave to eat can be driven by microbes. Every day we learn about new ways that microbes impact our human biology. We, as humans, are an ecosystem, and microbes are a big part of it. Now, not surprisingly, viruses also infect microbes. These are the viruses that are hidden, and these are the viruses I want you to know about. I love viruses, and this is my favorite virus. This is the ultimate virus of microbes. This is T4. T4 infects E. coli, a bacterium. 
It was discovered in sewage decades ago. It's now known, or its brethren are, to dominate the oceans. Scientists studying how it worked built the foundations of modern molecular biology, and T4's genes make enzymes which thrive throughout the life sciences and biotechnology as products that we use. T4 is also a master thief. It steals genes from all over the place, and it evolves these genes, and then it runs those all around the viral gene pool. T4 is probably the best studied virus of microbe out there, and we only know what half its genes do. The other half are a mystery. And beyond T4, there's countless viruses of microbes yet to be discovered. If you put them end to end, they stretch light years away from this planet. I study viruses and microbes because understanding them will help us solve pressing world problems. To me, one of those most pressing world problems is climate change. And this is a plot of atmospheric carbon dioxide over the last 400,000 years in Earth. You can see that it cycles between 200 and 300 parts per million until recently the Industrial Revolution when humans started to burn fossils, fossil fuels, and forests. This accelerated the release of ancient carbon into the atmosphere, unprecedented rates of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Not only did we break the 300 part per million barrier, but in 2016, we broke the 400 part per million barrier. We're truly into uncharted territory in Earth's history. But actually, it could be twice as bad it turns out the oceans soak up half of the carbon dioxide that we humans put into the atmosphere, fortunately for us. Unfortunately for the oceans, this comes at a cost, multiple costs. The first cost is acidification. We have acidified the oceans globally. This is measurable. This acidification impacts probably every ocean organism, but particularly calcium carbonate containing organisms like this coral. Coral reefs have been decimated by acidification. Pristine reefs are an endangered, if not extinct, entity. The second cost is warming. Carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is a greenhouse gas that warms the atmosphere, which in turn warms the surface oceans. And a warm surface oceans leads to dead zones and harmful algal blooms, which we hear about in the news all the time. It also empowers hurricanes like this one to come more often and more intensely. Extreme weather is another cost of climate change. Just ask the insurance adjusters. Carbon dioxide, when it gets into the ocean, its fate is controlled by microbes. And these microbes have been playing this game globally for billions of years. This particular microbe of phytoplankton and its predecessors oxygenated our atmosphere two and a half billion years ago when they invented photosynthesis. Today, they're responsible for every other breath you take worth of oxygen. Half of the oxygen you breathe comes from these ocean microbes. We're now tasking them with battling climate change for us. But behind the scenes, there's 50 million viruses in a mouthful of seawater. Those viruses likely infect every ocean organism. And I can imagine many ways that those viruses are changing and short-circuiting the ocean carbon pump. Now, studying the oceans is an awesome task. But just like those vaccines, we need to understand the ecology and evolutionary rules that govern our ocean viruses if we want to harness their power for good. How can we possibly do this in a complex and dynamic environment like the oceans and at a global scale? In 2008, I met Professor Chris Bowler at a conference, and he inspired me with an audacious idea. He and a handful of oceanographers wanted to sail around the world studying the oceans. He talked about the Tara Oceans Project, which was named after a sailboat called the Tara that was meant to be the centerpiece of this expedition. He talked about how they were going to sample everything smaller than fish larvae globally. I was blown away at the scale and audacity of this idea, this dream. I talked about viruses. 
And he thought, oh, I guess we're not sampling everything smaller than fish larvae. And it's not Chris's fault. Few people knew about those viruses. We couldn't study them, certainly not at that scale. We didn't have the tools. But my lab was developing the tools. And so Chris asked if I would join the Tar Oceans Project as a scientific coordinator. I thought it sounded awesome. I was a brand new faculty, so of course I did this. And a decade later, the Tar Oceans Consortium has been living this dream. We're now hundreds of researchers, and we've systematically surveyed viruses to fish larvae throughout all the waters that you see here and many that I didn't get a chance to plot up. These planetary scale diversity maps, we first wanted to use to study climate change. So we revisited an old question about the ocean carbon pump. Decades of oceanographers have been focused on the ocean carbon pump because of its importance in global biogeochemistry and climate change. This is a plot of carbon sinking in the oceans. Areas of red and yellow are where sinking is high. Areas of blue are where sinking is low. Tar Oceans was unique in that we had planetary scale diversity maps. We also had big data analytics to apply to this problem. And we wanted to ask the question, which organisms best predicted carbon flux or carbon export in the oceans? And we had studied bacteria, archaea, eukaryotes, viruses. And it turned out that viruses best predicted carbon flux. This was a big surprise, because the paradigm was viruses should keep carbon small. They blow up cells that get remineralized and recycled. Instead, it looks like viruses produce sticky blown up cells, and those aggregate, and those aggregates sink out of the water column. Alternatively, viruses infect cells and manipulate the biochemistry of those cells to make them tastier to grazers. It turns out follow-on experiments have confirmed many of these in silico hypotheses. Big data analytics and biodiversity maps at the global scale have changed the way we think about the ocean carbon pump, its role in climate change, and the role of viruses being elevated right to the front. Viruses and microbes are powerful. Our tools to study them are transformatively changing. Our oceans toolkit we're now adapting to many other environments. And I'm convinced at this point, we're starting to learn the ecological and evolutionary rules that'll allow us to take another step. That next step is to use viruses to design the microbial communities we want. These microbes that are so important in all of us and in the world, we could design them with viruses. In the oceans, that could mean combating climate change. In soils, that could mean mobilizing nutrients to better grow plants. And in humans, perhaps two things. One, killing pathogens with viruses instead of antibiotics to stem the oncoming antibiotic resistance epidemic. And two, more subtle, new therapies where viruses become a tool to tune microbial dysbiosis and complex diseases like autism. Together, the rules that we're going to learn about from oceans, soils, and humans <clears throat> should lead to an emerging synthesis that helps us be smart about using viruses to design microbial communities. I hope that you leave today realizing viruses of microbes are nanoscale entities with global scale impacts, our ability to study them today is unprecedented, and they can help solve some of the world's most pressing problems. I've just shared with you a 100-year-old idea, the idea to use viruses to target microbes. However, today, I think we finally can and should do it. Thank you. <laughs>